Yes. So we are recording. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, okay, so um, we forgot to send out, or I didn't send out a reminder, but um, as we just tried last week, we're gonna try to review the meetings ahead of the minutes ahead of time so we can just go ahead and vote on them. So um, give maybe I'll give folks a minute to say whether they have any comments that they want to make. Um, and then we also need to just assign a new minute taker, which I think might, I think Don, we might be back to you. Really? Potentially. <laughs> we need a bigger committee. Laura, I, th I think it's Andra and then me after. Okay. Andra, are you able to take minutes today? Yes, I can take minutes. Sorry, yeah. Andra. <laughs> no, no, I, I was thinking it's been a while. <laughs> okay, good. I, I I'll just make a quick plug for Andrew. I, I met someone that knows her. And just, I've always known we have got a great committee with great people. But when I dropped your name, Andra, no. they were, oh my, oh, she works so hard. She does so much. She's so amazing. So it takes a lot of good minutes. Takes yeah. a lot of good minutes. <laughs> You should let her take minutes every every meeting. <laughs> yeah. The best. So, Laura, just for the benefit of attendees, I just wanted to let people know that this meeting is being recorded, and that um, the video uh, transcriptions can be found on the town's YouTube website. So, if you went to YouTube and searched for Amherst ECAC or Energy and Climate Action Committee, you should be able to find. Um, the recordings and there is a link on the town's ECAC website uh, page as well to those recordings. I will say they're not necessarily up to date, but you can find them there. Great, thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Um, okay, any comments on the minutes or otherwise anyone want to motion to accept them? I have no comments. I'll move to accept them. I will second. Great, thank you. Okay, I need a voice vote. So, Roof? Yes. Ragavan? Yes. Allison? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Selman? Yes. Breger? Yes. And Rose? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Great. Um, so we'll go to, to public comment. If anyone would like to make a public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised. So we typically also give opportunity at the end of the meeting. Um, Okay, not seeing anybody. So we will move on to staff updates. Okay, uh, so a number of things. Uh, first is that you may recall about a year or so ago, uh, we had applied for a DC fast charge electric vehicle charger charging station for um, downtown. We only applied for one, they are very expensive and there is uh, some additional operating costs that the town would incur in getting one, but we did actually receive grant funding for one. So um, we'll be moving that forward probably within the next few months. Um, the, the state supplies the cost, and we got this through the Mass EBIT program. So the state will supply the, the charging unit, but um, we do have to go through a process with Eversource where they'll actually provide the installation costs as well and the electric hookup for that unit. So um, I've already been in touch with them because 
and it's been so long. I think people people thought that wasn't even moving forward any longer. So it was kind of a bit of a surprise. And it does look like they awarded more than they had originally estimated that they would. So which is, I, I think, just you know, knowledge that we need more um, fast charging infrastructure within within and throughout the state. So that's coming. Um, and I will also know that there isn't another fast charging unit for at least within 15 miles of us. So um, it'll be really useful for a lot of people. Does it have um, a, a location in town that you can disclose? Going, yes, um, yes, at least as the way we had um, proposed in the application, it's going to be, I think, in the lot on Kellogg Street by the Ann Whalen Apartments. Oh, yeah. um, so, uh, so we're proposing to put it there. That's uh, the town manager actually requested that it go there. Mm -hmm. um, and then we are looking at investigating a program that could help us transition the entire school bus fleet to electric vehicle buses. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just, you know, we're just exploring that opportunity, but it looks promising. So um, I've been um, on the periphery of that conversation. And of course I'm, you know, all like, yes, we should do it, but it's not my decision, but I'll certainly be cheerleading that um, effort. I think Jesse has a question. I, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I'm just curious, do you know what happens to the buses? I, I assume someone else uses the buses if our fleet goes electric and it just, it helps, it's, it helps, but it, it doesn't fully take all those buses offline. Is that that correct? Uh, uh, no, I think we'd be replacing the buses. Uh, we might want to hang on to one because I know that there's some um, there is some concern about range for field trips with the electric buses. But you know, we might so we might hang on to one for that purpose. But I, you know, again, this has just been a conversation. There's nothing definitive, but I think it would re actually replace the buses. I don't think we would be hanging on to the diesel buses, except for maybe one if we decide we need to. Yep. So, and then um, we also had a company reach out to us about the possibility for a community solar project. Typically, I'm not, um, you know, we get a lot of these calls all the time. Uh, but this one was different and did have an opportunity to specifically serve um, the rental population, which I was kind of excited about. And um, I don't want to say too much because we're just having initial conversation. Like we're just, I had a conversation with representatives from the company, but we're going to have a meeting with the town manager and the finance director. Um, soon and have them sort of hear more about what they have to offer and you know like anything these everyone makes their their opportunities sound like the best opportunities that are possibly out there but I do think this one to me has some elements of it that are more promising so I will definitely keep you informed about that one thing I personally want to make sure of is that if we went this route that there's no um no impact to the CCA opportunities I just want to make sure that you know, there's no conflict there. So I am gonna reach out to our um, consultant just to sort of get their them their opinion to weigh in on, on this opportunity. Um, and then I just wanted to tell you about the sociocracy training that I just recently experienced yesterday through um, the uh, Collaborative for Educational Services out of Northampton, which um, houses the Healthy Hampshire program. And because I'm doing some work with their Food Policy Council, the, the newly formed uh, Hampshire Hampshire Food Policy Council, so it's a regional effort. Um, they're using soci sociocracy as their um, governance model and decision making model and tool. Um, and I just will I'll send you all a link to that um, site, but it's very, very interesting. Um, it's a very slow moving process, but it's very interesting because it really gives people an opportunity to um, all have a voice and it really makes sure and ensures that it's a more sort of equitable decision-making process. So I encourage you when I send you the link to, to check it out. Um, I don't know it's necessarily something we want to adopt, but I think it's something worth looking at. Um, you know, I, I feel like as we talk about equity and the way that we know meetings have always um, 
been run, there's kind of a very similar format. And I think we all have experienced this um, desire to move things quickly, but sociocracy actually takes more time. However, even though it takes time up front, in the long run, because the decisions are really, really vetted well, in the long run, those decisions tend to stick and not come up with additional problems later because people have really vetted them out at the beginning. So, um, so it's very interesting. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and uh, also last thing, I updated the web page, the ECAC web page to include the packets. Um, so now there's a folder for the 22, 2022 packets are there. Um, I'm, it's a little different than you might have seen before in the past, it was one folder and all the documents were scanned. Now the folders show up as a folder. And if you click on the folder, each document is a separate document. So you'll be more easily able to access the mean, um, items from the meetings, both you and the public will have an easier time sort of identifying, getting those packets. I will say that the packets up until that point will not be in that format and I still have to I have a backload um, of packets that I have to get back on the site and that might take a little while, but at this point going forward, the meeting packets will be posted. So, and my apologies for the backlog in our year of COVID. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, that's do you have a question? Yeah, because Stephanie, where does the funding come from for the electrification of the bus fleet? So that's uh, it's a company that um, they would they would actually own the buses. So the okay. model is that they own the buses and we would essentially um, lease them. Got it. So, okay. but again, that's why it's being in. You know, I think the town has to really sort of weigh how that would work and whether this is something we would want to pursue. And of course, this is through the schools. It's um, you know their decisions. So. Um, it's just a conversation that I know was out there and I know it's something that this committee has really advocated for. So I wanted to share. Just so people know, we already um, lease most of the buses that are used in the um, region, you know, the, the regional system and the, the school, um, elementary school system. So we have nine buses uh, that we own. So I'm sure that's yeah, what they're but... starting out talking about, but um, because the, a uh, three-year lease uh, contract was signed last winter um, with the, the companies that we've been working with, but maybe it could expand. Yeah, I think it's slightly different though. I mean, those companies don't have electric buses. So this would be leasing, taking that lease away and leasing with a company or whatever. Um, but yeah, we, we, we shared some of that information earlier, I think last year around Montgomery County in Maryland, yeah. moving toward, towards a leasing program. I know we talked about that a bit, um, so that's exciting to hear. But Jesse, to your question, yeah, I mean, they're going to not be decommissioned, right? They'll be sold to someone else. So, I mean, this is a problem with all kinds of used vehicles and cars and when, you know, so, um, but it's, a, it's supporting definitely. the replacement, you know, it's supporting the replacements, the next fleet that gets purchased by these companies and they're seeing a financial model to move it forward. It's a good thing. Totally. We can yeah, it's going to happen with, with our have... own internal combustion vehicles by 2030 as well. You know, we're going to be seeing a much broader scale transition to EVs. To, the, to your point, Jesse. Um, Dwayne and then Vasu again. Yeah, just quickly, I want to back up to the website, and this is not a biggie at all, Stephanie, but um, I actually did have the, the need to um, share the CARP report with somebody a couple uh, uh, since the last meeting. And I went to the website and I couldn't even find the CARP report. Um, and maybe it's in a packet, but who would know what, what month to look or what meeting to look at? And I, and I was wondering if some of our more prominent reports, maybe our annual reports and like the CARP report could be um, separately um, listed um, on or somehow accessible on the website. I can ask Dwayne, but that's, it actually lives on the Sustaining Amherst page. And it actually has its own link. I did Google it and found it, but okay. Yeah, yeah it has its own link. It's, um, it's um, 
it's actually listed as carp. Like if you Googled carp, you and know, I did. Well, I, I you'd find it. I found a fish probably, but, uh, oh. but uh, uh, <laughs> two A's. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But, um, um, but yeah, I, I did. I, I did hear you. I, I hear you. It. And we've talked about it, but I think there was a reason why they, it's not on that, that page and why it lives on the sustaining Amherst page. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it could live there, but, but we did, there. well, we did, um, and I, and I actually brought this up a meeting or two ago that because Vasu had brought it up that he had trouble finding it. So I had worked with IT so that when someone does a search in the search engine, they should be able to find it fairly easily now. They've created pathways that should get to it faster and easier um, if you do a search by name versus going to the ECAC site. I don't think it should be on our committee page or the sustaining Amherst page. I think it should be on the main town page. It's a town plan. It's really important. It should be very prominent. I can ask. <laughs> I can always ask. <laughs> yes, yeah, Stephanie, question around the electrification of buses. Are we going to start planning ahead for building infrastructure for charging stations then? Um, well, so uh, for the buses, that's something separate that the schools are dealing with. And I think that the infrastructure has to, is part of that. And again, I don't have details about that. So I don't even want to say more about it because it's not, I'm just sharing information about a discussion that happened, but I have not been involved in that. So I don't have all the fine details and it's not the municipality's decision to make, it's the school system's decision to make. So I just want to be clear about that. Um, so I, as far as, you know, supporting buses, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that certainly um, with the EV infrastructure, there's certainly opportunities that we're investigating, uh, you know, through grant funding to get more charging infrastructure in town. That's, that's something that's an ongoing, whenever we have an opportunity, we'll just keep pursuing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope it works out quickly. Um, but the solar moratorium, I mean, it's going to be a challenge with installation of solar until we were talking until the solar study is completed. Well, that's so, for large scale solar, not yeah. for smaller solar. It's for a certain, it's for a much larger capacity, um, is what we're talking about for the moratorium. Okay. That's right. And yeah. the moratorium yeah. would not include anything mounted over impervious surfaces. So it would not apply to parking lot canopies if anybody decided to do that. <clears throat> yeah, and it was under over two gigawatts, I think. 250 kW, 250 yeah. kilowatts, yeah. about one acre okay. of ground mount. Got it. Thank you. Great. Um, do we have any ECAC member updates? Um, I'll share, oh, go ahead, Andra. Oh, I, I was just gonna give the um, state legislative report, um, all the climate bills that um, any organization wanted were given an extension, <laughs> pretty much. There were a few that were actually reported out of committee favorably, which is what you want, but an extension is pretty good because it, in this case, probably means that um, some of them are going to make it into an omnibus bill. So. Thanks. Thanks, Andra. I appreciate you updating us on that. Those important things that are hard to keep um, track of. <laughs> I um, I don't know if anybody else was able to watch the town council meeting this week where they discussed the solar moratorium, but um, looks like Steve did. Anybody else? No. Um, it was an interesting discussion. Um, they, they need to discuss it again. But one thing that came across that I just wanted to share with you all is that there was certainly quite a bit of um, talk about the importance of climate action and how we need to move quickly on climate action from people both for and against the moratorium. So um, I think we have an opportunity right now to really um, 
give them clear examples of what we could actually do. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to flag that for folks that, you know, particularly I think around the renew the um, rental housing work that Steve and Andre you've been involved with, um, some of the discussions we've had with the Affordable Housing Trust, um, you know, things around legislative pressure or other bylaws we might want to push through. Um, the moratorium itself is not going to, even if the moratorium didn't pass, that that act in itself is not going to push forward any climate action. So um, like, how do we um, sort of take the counselors for their word and make sure that we're actually supplying them and helping them push through some actions that we can we can start taking. Um, so that was my sort of positive takeaway from from that discussion. Um, I don't know, Steve, if you have anything you want to add. No, that was my same thought that um, both counselors and uh, members of the public sometimes ask questions along the line of, well, why aren't we doing building efficiency? And I'm like, yeah, we are. We're trying to. We're working on it. Um, so I think the council is hungry for evidence of actions that we've done. So our annual report is like perfect timing. And if we had any other big asks of the town council right now, yeah, they might be received quite favorably. Agreed. But yeah. So maybe, I, oh, God. I'm just going to add, I, I thought the discussion that I heard both at the town council, but also earlier at CRC and planning board on the moratorium was, was really good. It was a really deep discussion. A lot of interesting stuff raised, uh, both on the moratorium itself and the bigger issues of solar. So it's kind of neat to see <laughs> democracy in action, even though it takes hours and hours and hours and hours of time. Agreed. Um, Okay, well, maybe we can pick that up a bit as we go through our other agenda items. Um, but is any other any other updates from folks that that on things that aren't on the agenda? Um, I'm sorry, I um, don't have the agenda right in front of me. Um, should we report in on our communications with counselors now, or is that on there? Yeah, that's the next one. So why don't we just go to that? So why don't okay. Andre, well, we'll, we'll, start. No, but there may be other updates. So let, let's hold up. Let's see if other updates. I'm not seeing any, so go right ahead. Okay. Um, I have an um, appointment next week. Um, next week? No, uh, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> um, to talk with the District 3 counselors, and I've sent them all the documents and they're anxiously awaiting our meeting. I can go next. I reached out to District 5 counselors and Pamela suggested that maybe it's worth bringing all the counselors in into one conversation and um, scheduling a call with them. But I also reached out to District 5 because, I mean, I live in that district. So I reached out to Shalini and she was interested in, in meeting. So I know, Steve, you probably reached out to Shalini as well. Um, but District 4 basically <laughs> suggested that we just have a meeting together with all the counselors during their meeting session. So any thoughts on what we should do? Uh, I told them that I'll get back to them based on our conversation. Yeah, Stephanie. Um, Vasu, it's up to the uh, council president um, whether to schedule you all to meet with the council. Uh, there's an actual planning process for meetings that they go through with the town manager um, and it happens before each meeting. So the request would have to go through the council president and they don't necessarily have to grant that opportunity. I mean, it's not that they wouldn't, it's just that they have so many other things uh, that they're dealing with. So um, even though that was a suggestion, I think the fact that you have at least another council in your district counselor who's willing to meet with you, um, I would recommend seizing that opportunity and reaching okay. back out to the other one, maybe. Okay. 
Yeah, Steve. I had, I've had great conversations with the two District 5 counselors, Shalini and Anna Devlin Gadier. Um, hello, I think they're listening in, or listed as the attendees and the participants. Um, really good conversations with both of them. And I learned stuff from them. I think they learned stuff from me. And I um, was, enjoyed them. And I uh, look forward to having more of those. And I would say, Vasu, that, yeah, we should suggest to them that they suggest to the council president that they ask ECAC to come in at a meeting to give some kind of a presentation. We've, we've sort of wanted that ourselves for a while, but I guess the invitation has to start with counselors through their president to make that happen. So that's a suggestion okay. we can make to counselors. Okay. Thanks. Real quick, I'm sorry, uh, I, Laura. I just uh, wanted to say that I did send in the annual report to the council president with um, a request for you all to appear before them to present the report. So great. I just wanted to make sure you all knew that. I meant to put that in my report. So great. sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, Andra. Sorry. Oh, no, a uh, suggestion to um, anyone who uh, assigned counselors um, are hesitant to meet. Um, we are designated as the liaisons to them. You know, it's like, this is official, you know, it's, it's something that we're initiating and every counselor is gonna have a meeting with one of us on some regular basis. And so I just push back harder. I also think that, um, you know, we can we can listen in again to the next council meeting where they're discussing the moratorium and the extent that folks are bringing up supportive climate action. We could kind of use that as another option to to reach out, which I will plan to do with my um, district one people who I did email them on Monday, but I haven't heard back yet. So. I didn't do my homework yet, <laughs> uh, but plan to do that uh, and apologize for that. Um, I think it's a, it would be a great idea to, to meet with the council as a, as a whole. That, that being said, I think um, and easy for me to say, because I haven't done it yet, but I think one of the purposes of us getting in touch with each of our counselors um, personally is that it, it would be more of an opportunity for a longer term relationship where they could you know, feel free to call contact us and, and us back out to them on an as needed basis, I think was also the intent just to have some more um, coordination and, and uh, 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 rapport, I guess, with, with the counselors. Okay, great. Any other updates on this topic? Ibid. Sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> I just said Ibid, same as Dwayne. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's speaking Latin. I don't know these I thought there was either. a frog. <laughs> <laughs> just for those who haven't had a chance yet, the counselors that I think are actual real people, so they're, <laughs> they're not too scary to talk to. <laughs> and I think those who aren't on CRC or GOL who have already been dealing closely with the solar moratorium, I think some of those other counselors may be seeing it for the first time and may have lots of interesting questions to ask us. So that'd be a good chance to reach out, a good topic of conversation for them. Great. And is anybody, who's reaching out to the at-large people? Oh, Don. I actually, I've only got two, but... I had Andy and Mandy Joe, but I don't know if the third has been assigned. I've got the third. I've got Alicia. Ah, there you go. Okay, okay. great. Um, yeah, Josie, Alicia seems really like she's got some ideas from the CARP, so probably might be a good conversation. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's good. I think this is an awesome way to to connect and awesome. Okay, great. Um, so we'll keep pushing forward um, on that.
All right. Let's see what's the next on the agenda here. Ah, I lost it. Okay, here it is. Um, okay, town council request for ECAC response to Berkshire gas outreach. Andrew, do you want me to share the document? Um, yeah, I guess so. I, I, I was, I'm, but I'm going to bring it up in, in on my computer and be editing any comments people have. Um, so okay, you won't see with them, me. but. Okay. Well, just bear with me one moment. Okay. Okay. You should all be able to see it now. So I um, did take the in ideas that we um, talked about. Um, I put in a little complaint that we were only given notice in late January. Um, and I kind of went down real hard on our vision for the future of gas is that we won't have any in 30 years. and. Um, I also talked about um, you know, safety, health issues that we have. Um, and, um, and mentioned the moratorium as a good thing um, that the town will, is following, you know, a net zero building approach and encourages private development too as well. I'd like, I'd love to make, say that stronger, but since we want to make this a, you know, this is it, we don't have time for editing, send, you know, send it. Um, then I, I didn't think we could like create policy here. Um, so, and then that we would welcome the um, district heating idea of gas starting to sell um, ground source heating services. So I welcome your feedback, big or small. Andra, I would just in the second paragraph, second mm -hmm. sentence, this is what we need according to the IPCC. I would also include in there the mass 2050 decarbonization plan, um, perhaps after IPC and before Amherst's. Okay. And honestly, I forget whether that 2050 decarbonization plan has gas going down to zero or going down to something like only 1% or a few percent. I, depends which yeah. pathway you look at, yeah. But, um, Not the actually other, called the decarbonization plan though, is it? It's CECP, uh, right? Decarbonization plan is the title of the report that I've been oh. looking at in the website. I think okay. there's the there's also the interim plan that's being developed for 2030 and 2040. Mm. All right, we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, okay. And then I don't know if you saw that there was just a um, press release, WBUR, um, environmental justice communities in Massachusetts are exposed to a much greater number of natural gas leaks from city streets in Massachusetts yeah. than other communities. Yeah, um, that was based on a really neat research paper. I don't know if there's a way to fold that in or reference that in that third paragraph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to make a similar comment about um, just tagging that and if there's a ref if there's a paper to reference even better. Yeah. Then the I mean, indoor. I 
Yeah, there's a lot of sources that we could put in, but frankly, they're not going to read this. The draft <laughs> report is coming out in one week, so it's already written, and um, they already have all the citations we could put in. So it's, it would only be for our own local audience. Yeah, that may be reason enough though, right? Um, yeah. If it's not too much of a pain. It is, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can, can do provide, it. I've got the links for that report, I, I will. Uh, yeah, yeah, I get, I get sent all get of it. those. I just have to find them in the email. Um, there was, I think it was a Stanford University study about the indoor health effects of natural gas, especially in smaller apartments. Yeah, Lawrence Labs. I think yeah, I read about that. I'm not sure I have a link to that. I think that was featured in a New York Times article that went around. But I'll, I'll look through and, and put in a bunch of sources. The only other thing, Andrew, first of all, this is great. It's, it's concise. I like the tone. Um, it, do you think there's a, a place to add that we know that the, the, the leakage of, of natural gas is a major contributor and, and not just the burning? Is, is it worth adding that it's the actual is, climate impact? Yeah, just th there's okay. I think that's. And I, I think it, I think that's a partially known fact. And so mm -hmm. any chance that we have to like add that on top of a natural gas conversation is worth it. Thank you, I'll add that. I think that goes like right near the beginning. Yeah, I, I also think this looks good. I like the tone, um, it's fairly short. And I guess I'd like to say that we go ahead and prove it pen, with the comments that you're, or the small edits that you're going to make. Okay. And Can I offer one, one more comment? Um, and um, um, I don't know if we want to suggest that they um, don't look at hydrogen or biogas for that matter. Um, and I, I'm, I, for one, am skeptical that we can literally electrify everything uh, or, or, or that that really is going to going to work. Um, let me just, Dwayne, let me let me frame this. This is just going to the local distribution companies, the retail gas. We're not talking about the um, gas industry that's going to be, um, you know, could, could be transitioning to providing the hydrogen that we absolutely will need for jet fuel. <laughs> this is just for our homes. Uh, yeah, or, 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 or a central plant that, that uh, no, uh, no, all no. Of UMass or, no. Uh, no, it's not that. This is just about what's piped under our streets to our buildings. It's not for electricity generation at all. No, 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 but for uh, district heating. Um, for district heating, um, I don't know, 30 years from now, if hydrogen's cheap and you can set up a, uh, a, a small plant um, that, you know, basically just makes water and water vapor and, uh, yeah, um, we really then, want to say that thirty years from now it'd be okay. No, but I, I would. I was just going to suggest that we uh, that we don't say that we do not see any need. Uh, okay. That that you know that we see only only niche potential niche needs or something like that. Yeah. Uh, for for those for the, those technologies is all is all I was saying. I that I wasn't going to suggest we <laughs> promote it, uh, but just acknowledge that. Uh, um, have at it if you want, <laughs> but it, it's just okay. a niche. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, 
I'll, I'll tone it down a little. It's really important to mention hydrogen because that's the, yes, that's what they meant. The cool, shiny thing that the gas companies are really hooked on trying to push that, oh, we can have clean gas. It's hydrogen gas. And, um, and yes, it, it could be made cleanly and is going to be important for some things, but not for piping under our streets and into our homes. at least couldn't be done now. And I don't know, hydrogen fires are invisible. Did you know? Okay, great. Any other comments on this? I think Steve suggested that we vote to approve this with the comments we've 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 made, and then um, Stephanie, would you would you then send it back to Lynn? Is that the process here? Yep. So Andrew should just get me the clean final copy, and I'll forward it along to the council okay. president. Thank you, Andrew, for writing this up. Um, yep. Thanks for feedback. Do we want to do we do we need to officially vote on this? You should probably. Okay. Um, I'll make the motion to um, submit this to the town council with the edits discussed during the meeting. I'll second that. Great. Okay. So I need a voice vote. Roof? Yes. Ragavan? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Selman? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Rose? Yes. Allison? Yes. Okay. It's unanimous. Great. All right. I've lost my agenda again. <laughs> One second. Oh, there it is. Um, I have too many things open. Okay. So solar study and solar bylaw update. So I know Stephanie, you had sent an updated document to the group yes. on this. And um, I'll turn it over to you maybe to walk us through that. Sure. So um, I guess I'll I guess I'll share it. It is in your packets after all. So just give me a moment so I can set this up. Okay, so um, this is the proposal that came out of um, many conversations that we've sort of been having uh, with both the ECAC, but also when we've gone to various meetings, the planning board had a meeting, CRC had a meeting, um, and the planning director, Chris Brestrup and I sat and talked about some of the, some of the information that's been sort of bandied about as a process to move this forward and so we have this proposal into the town manager this is a draft subject to change i think in concept i think the town manager is on board um, but basically it just sort of initially lays out the background and need for a study which i think has been well communicated at very uh, several meetings um, but then we sort of got down to uh, based on some of the conversations and some of the um, resident concerns we had proposed putting together a working group so it would be a solar working group um, and it suggests that we um, get representation from various members of the community so there would be a member from the ECAC and I think um, Duane has already sort of talked about his uh, experience with solar um, solar siting and recommendations for best practices. So we were thinking, you know, and I know he's already said he'd be interested in doing this. Um, and then a member of the planning board, um, a member of the conservation commission to sort of talk about the land use of the town um, and the natural resource protection. And then the water 
Resources Protection Committee, uh, someone, a representative from that committee who could address the hydrogeology or hydrogeological aspects of um, impacts of solar, and then a UMass forest ecology expert. Uh, then again, a representative on behalf of the legal aspects of solar development. So that's maybe someone who would work with like, um, you know, like a large landowner or someone who understands the, the legal aspects and ramifications of um, a large scale solar development. So someone who um, potentially works on behalf of that industry, but as from the legal perspective, and then a representative from the solar industry who um, could just talk about, you know, what some of the, you know, um, you know, what it takes to build solar so that we actually have somebody who is knowledgeable about an actual solar installation, what it takes, the um, various steps that they go through and um, has a, you know, sort of real insider knowledge on the, on the industry. So the idea is that that committee, that working group, I should say, would come together. But from that working group, there would be two subcommittees, because there are two things that are being called for, which you also called for specifically was a solar assessment, also being called a solar study, and then development of the bylaw. There is definitely um, a push uh, from some of the committees to be moving and developing the bylaw right away simultaneously. Um, but we know that this committee, especially the ECAC, really believes in the importance of having an assessment done. And we have funding to get that started. So the idea would be to have these two subcommittees and that um, the one subcommittee would work specifically on the assessment and work with the consultant um, on, um, on developing that, um, that assessment study, doing the study, um, doing outreach with the community on prioritizations, um, but they would work with that subcommittee would sort of be the, the contact for the consultant. And then the other subcommittee would be uh, developing the bylaw. And the idea is that because they're under one committee, they actually come back and share information. So even if the assessment isn't completed, um, in, in my head anyway, if you have these two subcommittees coming back to the table as they're developing both the bylaw and the, the assessment, um, that they're sharing information as they go along. So it's not like they're working in silos and the bylaw isn't being informed by the assessment. It might not be completed, but there's certainly gonna be information that as they move along with the study, they'll have information to share with the, with the bylaw group. So the idea is that these two subcommittees can then come back together and share their information in the process. Um, this is essentially the charge, basically, that they're going to come together and um, encourage responsible development of solar. So this was the committee charge. I can, uh, you all can read that. Um, but basically, it's just, uh, I guess I'll read it for the benefit of folks who might be listening but can't see this. Um, the charge of the solar study, uh, solar bylaw working group, I should, I'm sorry, that should be solar assessment, solar bylaw working group is to develop a solar assessment that will guide and encourage responsible development of solar through the creation of a solar bylaw as the result of a process that engages the community in identifying community values and identifying and prioritizing locations for said development. So that's essentially the charge. And then um, I've already talked about the working group structure. And then there's the role of a consultant. So actually um, there is some funding, I think, for from through the planning board and the planning department to engage a consultant to help develop the bylaw. So the subcommittee on drafting the bylaw will work with, um, will also work with a consultant as well. Um, and the idea though, where you all come in and where the planning board comes in is that as this process moves along, the bylaw is going to be reported back to, I mean, both, I should say both the assessment and the bylaw drafts, if you will, or processes will be reported back to the ECAC and the planning board. But ultimately, the planning board will sort of have the final, you know, say this is in the final form. This draft bylaw is in its final form. 
and the ECAC will have the final review of the solar assessment. So you all will be the final authority on what is final. Is this completed? And that would be um, hopefully in both a uh, form of a map uh, and a report. Um, but again, the idea is that you, it doesn't mean you won't have an opportunity to weigh in on the bylaw. It just means that your primary responsibility is the assessment. Um, but you will have an opportunity to weigh in on the bylaw. Likewise, the planning board will as well. And I imagine once those final drafts are done, that's when I think there'll probably be a um, broader community engagement and council review and, and other review. So um, can I stop sharing my screen or do you want me to keep sharing? Um, I think you can stop or stop unless Jesse, Jesse, you have a question? I have a, I, I do have a question. I don't know if you, you can stop sharing though. Okay. Um, I, I noticed in the, the proposed kind of members that, that there is not necessarily an expert um, in the sort of equity piece as far as not just disproportionate you know, wanting to have it avoid negative impacts, but also maximize positive impacts. Um, I don't know if if the consultant would fill that role. I just thought I'd mention it and and, and see if the, it. I'm sure you've thought of this already. Yeah. But. So I can tell you that the, so one of the things when the RFP is being developed, um, there has to be obviously when we're um, identifying the prioritization that has to go out to the community. That can't just be that's not going to be just identified, simply identified within the working group. That has to go out to the broader community and the idea is that there will be engagement of the community um, so that there is equity um, in this process in terms of the prioritization. So um, that will be written into the RFP. The consultant will have to do community engagement and that'll be their role. I mean, that's where also you know, when we look to this committee and people say, what can I do? Well, when we're in this process, I think when it comes to the community engagement and hopefully we're at a place where we can actually physically go out and meet with people in places, or maybe it's just gonna be better weather and we can meet outside a complex, um, you know, that we can go over, you know, to East Hadley Road and go to the complexes and like have a discussion with people and, you know, um, engage people more directly. Um, so, but the consultant will definitely be the ones to sort of work with us on that. Which, which yeah. consultant is that? Sorry, is that is that the consultant for the bylaw or for the uh, solar study? The solar, yeah. the solar study, because it's going to have to start. I mean, prioritization is going to be one of the first pieces that has to happen, and it has to happen for both the assessment and the bylaw. Like the can't, the bylaw can't be developed without that prioritization being identified. And that needs to be a process that engages the community. And because as we know, so many people have very strong feelings about certain aspects of this bylaw development. So we really need to make sure that, you know, there's um, representation and voices represented. And, you know, so, and I, imagine there'll be at least a few opportunities for that and maybe some online too, just to make sure if people can't meet in person, maybe people feel more comfortable online, but that'll all be worked out with the consultant. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just do something quickly and then Steve. I still think there may be need, I think that's important, um, a very important piece of the process. I still think there might be a need for another working group member who has, like if I'm looking at this list of the working group and I'm thinking what, what hat are, are people wearing? The only person in this working group that has a hat of climate action is us. And, and, I, and then there's a lots of hats on a, on a lot of other things. And so I don't think we should be the only ones wearing the hat of climate action. And if there was another person we could bring in, maybe from the UMass Energy Equity Group, um, and Duane would know more about that, or from some other group that can wear the climate and equity hat, I think that would add a lot to, to, the, to the group and that wouldn't put that all on ECAC. 
Yeah, it's Wayne and then, or Steve first, sorry, and then Dwayne. Yeah. I'm just gonna say, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I just, I was gonna mention this a little bit later, but I spoke with some folks with the Energy Transition Institute at UMass. And there may be some people there that could be the people that you're referring to. And I think that's a great idea. A um, couple of other questions, Stephanie. You, I think you said this is proposed and to the town manager now for his review. Yes. And then is, is he the, the one who gets to say, yes, this is what, how it will be? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the, com the members from committees, planning board, ECAC and whatnot, are they chosen by the committee or will the town manager choose those? Town manager has that authority to appoint committees. Okay. But, but so, maybe which committees is make recommendations right. and, but you know. but it but i i mean i wrote the proposal so if you all are saying you really feel the need for someone else um it certainly i can you know give feedback that you all recommended very strongly that there be another at least one other representative yeah i think i, yeah. I would agree with that i was asking just i guess a little bit more technical questions about the proposal at the moment okay. um go ahead i guess my other thought which is a little less technical more more bigger is there, there's sort of two different tasks, big different tasks there, and the two subcommittees form. Would those subcommittees bring in any additional members or additional resources? Uh, they could, but I think that has to be, uh, the working group has to figure that out. Okay. Okay, that's it for now for me, thanks. Um, I think I missed, um, or, or there's not enough residents without a particular expertise, just lived experience in Amherst. So do you, so you're saying as part of the working group, I mean, there is gonna be community engagement. So there will be opportunities for people to certainly weigh in. This is just a response to people's um, people's particular concerns. These are in response to residents' concerns for these particular issues that feel like they need a certain level of expertise. And then it'll go out to the to the community for, you know, for feedback and input. I'd like to see residents um, who live in, you know, the apartment complexes on their um, well, this is to plan the outreach, you know, not, not just being recipients of something that other people have structured. I think the concern with, from in my, I, I hear you, Andra. I, I think the concern in my mind with that is that it's gonna need to be, I think we're just gonna open up a Pandora's box and we're gonna have to have a community member that's pro-solar and a communicator that's anti-solar and it's got to be even and all of that stuff. And we're not gonna get people from our complexes. We're gonna get the people that have already been fully engaged in this in this conversation and have are already have opinions. So I think it's, it, I, I like the idea that we're keeping it at the level of people that are, you know, working, with, with specific expertise that is gonna to contribute to both of these developments. But I also agree that it has to, there has to be significant outreach. I think we've proven through our outreach on CARP that that's possible to do. Um, and Stephanie has good experience with that. So I'm, I'm not too worried about, about that piece, but I, would, I, would, I don't know about expanding the working group to beyond this a, a group of people who have specific expertise but uh, maybe others have thoughts yeah jesse and then i see steve stand up uh, just a quick realization too of when you asked for another um climate uh concerned person i realized stephanie and someone who's the track record of career of of outreach and equity and it, you know those two things are at basically at Stephanie's highest priorities right now. So the mere fact that she's overseeing all this might take care of a lot of our concerns. 
Well, and you all, I mean, as far as the assessment, you all, like I said, you all are the ones it's coming back to. So if you're looking at the assessment and you're saying things are really missed here, I mean, you have, it has to, it does have to include the concerns of residents and other issues beyond just the climate piece, because if you're going to develop something, it's got to be representative of what everybody in the community wants as best as you can get there. So. Yeah, Steve and then Dwayne, I think. I think you're going to have Dwayne next. Before okay, me. Dwayne, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure if I have a fully uh, thought out thought yet, <laughs> but uh, that being said, I, I did want to uh, second sort of the, the I'm not sure about concern, but just issue of whether there is enough representation of, of uh, climate concerned perspectives on the committee. I think that's certainly us, um, but we're also uh, sort of serve as the recipient of, of this. Uh, and I do feel like, um, I'm not sure about the planning board particularly, but you know the conservation committee, water resources, ecology, forest ecology, that's gonna be all about the reasons why to be cautious about solar, which is critically important uh, perspectives. Um, uh, but but what's also expect you know critically important is that we have a climate emergency that we need to make trade offs. Um, and so and I don't see and obviously the solar developers will make that case too. But um, they're they're uh, a bit biased, if you will, or could be would be perceived as biased. I do wonder whether, and I, I was thinking, you know, maybe somebody from the state uh, could say, we got these targets, we got these commitments, uh, we got, we, we uh, and not sort of advocate one way or the other, but just make that clear. Uh, or maybe an NGO um, that works in this area, uh, or potentially somebody from UMass, uh, you know, that, that's a climate scientist or climate expert um, that could, uh, could uh, represent that perspective as well. Or any other college <laughs> in, in, in the town. <laughs> Steve, I do want, um, I'm sorry, Dwayne, I do want to say just one thing really quickly in response to what you said is that um, a representative from the Conservation Commission is going to be talking about the legal parameters and okay. guidance that has to be met. I mean, yeah. they're coming this from a from technical, I mean, the idea is that no, it's not people showing up just with a passion. The idea of bringing experts in is because they're the ones who know the legislation, they know um, the laws, they, you know, they're the ones who sort of have the background that can bring that kind of an informed perspective to the development of both of these pieces. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thank you for that. Sure. I, I think what, um, you know, I'm, I really want to make sure that, that we have um, what Dwayne is saying that, um, you know, like how much are we morally obligated to put on Amherst land in Amherst parking lots, Amherst roofs, you know, all of that. That question has to be grappled with has to be an important piece of the outreach. And this will be great. This will be great for ECAC's work to have the community really thinking about our responsibilities. And you well. can create those opportunities in your outreach. Well, we're not doing the outreach for this process. Well, in, in certainly in the prioritization, I would, I would hope that you would be involved in those conversations. I mean, that's part of what, you know, we, we need to have opportunities to engage the community to identify those priorities. And what I was saying is it wouldn't just be the working group doing that. It needs to go out to the community and those opportunities need to be led. And so, and that's really a huge part of the assessment is identifying the priorities and the prioritization. So, um, and that's where Dwayne's background comes in with the work that you've recently done with communities in Massachusetts in, you know, identifying responsible solar siting, right? So, yeah. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Dwayne. I was just going to say we we have sort of some templates on some survey survey questions and 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 uh, focus group designs to that we could um, bring forward to the 
committee and to the consultant uh, and, and potentially work with the consultant uh, and, and work, work from there uh, to, to um, help, help in that process. Now I'm getting concerned about the um, assessment um, being too much about our, you know, getting our, about engagement and, and our values um, and not having enough in there, of, you know, like engineering studies, you know, because um, we, we did that, a lot of that already. I don't want to redo the CARP. We did and a lot of what though? We didn't do engineering of, studies. We, we haven't done do, those yet. I know, no, that's what I want the money to go to. Not a consultant who's going to lead us through another CARP kind of process. It's not, it's not, Andra, it's not. It's going to okay. be, it's, we're hiring someone to do an assessment and it will be an engineering study, but we have to identify priorities because members of the community have come out and very strongly voiced their concerns and opinions about the development of this. And you can't, and I hear you and I'm, you know, where I, you know, I, I obviously see the strong need for this, but if you're going to say this is representative of the community, then it needs to be representative of the community. And I think you all have to share that moral, what you see as a moral obligation, right? So that's where you yeah. have the conversations with people. We're not going to get yeah. anywhere if we don't but have I a think conversation. I think we're, two opposite we're, things. <laughs> we're, we're, I mean, I hear you, but this is not, we don't have the privilege of having laws and, and policies in place around climate. So like, we don't have a person like the con con person who can be there bringing that in, right? We don't, we don't have that yet for climate. And so it feels like a lot of burden put on one ECAC member to be bringing all of that into this process. But it's and not, so I, I, but, and I, we need community outreach. We certainly do, but an input, but at the, and we will have that, but like, I just feel nervous that that this is not that we need someone else and I, and I don't think it can be the solar development industry person I actually don't agree that we should have a solar development industry person on here unless they agree to never work in Amherst or unless it would ideally be somebody maybe from one of the colleges who has experience in that industry who can or in, an engineering professor or someone who can speak to the engineering pieces but not have a financial input on not have a financial tie, but I, I, I don't think we're going to get that. We're not going to get what I'm thinking about from the community. Yeah, Steve. The, the solar bylaw will go to the town council and they will debate it, discuss it and decide whether to pass it. And that'll be a, a huge community process. And they presumably will have the, the, the right to make changes to it as it will be a recommended bylaw to them. So there'll be a lot of chance once that solar bylaw is developed for community input. So I would say that the solar assessment, I would view that as a bit more of a technical thing. Let's gather the facts about what land we have that's protected and what land cover types do we have in Amherst. Um, pull those, that's largely factual data, pull that together. Um, we'll fold it in with information on the state's plans and the, the assessment will probably just lay out, I would, I would, my vision would be, it would lay out, here are the different places where solar could go. And there's gonna be the first priority areas, second priority areas, third priority areas. And it's gonna be, if, if we want, you know, do our share by population, as I suggested, as, as just as a rough estimate, you know, that would be one proposal. It might be another one by income, um, separate from population. Anyways, that the assessment would be largely technical. And then, then that would feed a community discussion about the moral yeah. question that you raised, Andra, which is how much right. should we have? That's, that's right. much more than a technical question. That's a values question that involves a lot of input. So Steve, what you just laid out is, I just want to say that that's how I'm envisioning it. Good, so good. I'm just done. I just want to say that with everything that you've just said, that's exactly how I'm seeing the Great. process go. So Excellent. go ahead. I'm sorry. And then the, um, 
The only problem is with the, you know, they're happening concurrently. In my, my ideal world, the assessment would happen first. We would have those discussions about the moral values after the, the facts are gathered in the assessment, and then we would go on to the bylaw. But these are going to be happening in parallel, so it's not quite as clean. Um, the other thought that came to mind, I love the Anders, Anders idea about um, getting local community people involved in the outreach. And maybe that's something we can ask the consultant to do would be to bring in local people to help them, the consultants, plan the community outreach. But that would not necessarily be a member on the uh, working group. Yeah, Don. Oh, you're muted. I just have a quick question for you, Stephanie. Uh, other than the applicability of the Wetlands Protection Act to land in Amherst, what role would Conservation Commission have in, um, you know, such that they would be participating from start to finish in, in this process? I mean, there's, you know, there's a Wetlands Protection Act that says you can do this within so many feet of that and you can't. Right, but, but there's that, also open space. The Conservation Commission are the ones who oversee the conservation lands in the community. So there's also open space issues um, and there's ha wildlife habitat issues. You know, they don't just look at wetlands. They have, um, they have a broader charge than that. And I, so I just want to say, you know, I, um, I hear you all and I really appreciate all this feedback and I can share this um, with the town manager, certainly. But um, I think, Steve, I, I really appreciate your summary because that is exactly how it laid it out. And I do agree that ideally the assessment would be happening first, but that's not how things are moving forward. And if we didn't jump in now, and which is why I put this proposal together because my fear was that I was seeing this thing take off in a way that didn't feel like you were you as a committee were even heard in your request for the assessment. Um, so I just really felt like we needed to find a way to pull this together. And the reason why it's one working group is so it doesn't spin off in two different directions. So, I mean, it's the best, you know, and I hear, I hear what you all want. And it's just, it's also a matter of trying to make sure that there's a fair process where there's representation for people who have interests that I, and I understand where we're coming from. I totally get that. I agree that's all gonna come out in the bylaw process. Um, and the assessment will be more technical, but there is a piece of the assessment where you're going to have, like Steve said, zone one and zone two, and you're gonna sort of look at where, where are we gonna prioritize development for solar first? Are there gonna be opportunities for solar that we want to go to as the first layer of, of, a, of attacking that problem? Where is it going to get us the most bang for our buck, if you will? So that's where, you know, that's where the prioritization comes in. So I don't, I know that there was other maybe thoughts about what I was referring to, but that's really what I mean when I talk about prioritization. It's like, where in town are we going to say this should happen first? Yeah, Andra. I, yeah, um, I think we need to have an ECAC member on both subcommittees. Well, and again, that can easily happen. I mean, the working groups are gonna divide off into their subcommittees, but there's not gonna be enough people, I think, on the subcommittees to just be them. So that's where they get to, you know, there can be some outreach and invitation for people who are interested in working on those sub subcommittees. I mean, like voting members of the subcommittees. I think we need- That's what a, two. well, there'll be a subcommittee and people will, the subcommittees be, will. What? what? What do you mean voting members? I thought, of I thought that the working group is a combination of two subcommittees. It will be so that they report back to each other. But the work right. of the subcommittees are going to come back to the bigger working group. But subcommittees are going to sort of work on whatever they're working on, and they're going to need to have consensus around the piece that they're working on to bring back to the working group. So in that respect, there will be 
um, subcommittee members, I guess, voting in or weighing in on the consensus that they come to in moving their piece forward. Ultimately, it's coming to you all. The assessment's coming to you all for sort of the final blessing. And as yeah, the drafts yeah. go along, it's coming to you all. But, but one of us needs to be working on the bylaw too. You can be a member of the subcommittee for the working of the bylaw. I don't think that will be an issue. So I think we, we get more than one ECAC member? For the working group, the subcommittees are gonna be different. They're gonna, I, they're gonna be, there's gonna be, yeah, there's gonna be like a sub working group of the working group. <laughs> they're gonna need additional people to be on there and there can be a sort of outreach for additional people to come right. into so. working on the subcommittees. Um, so- I don't think you should call them subcommittees though, right? Cause they're working groups. That's a technical distinction, committee and working I think group. We're, I think we're trying to, yeah. I think we're trying to say though that there's one working group. We're trying to keep a cohesion between the two pieces. Okay. So that's why they're subcommittees, because ultimately they're going to be one working group working on yeah. the assessment and the bylaw. Okay. That's okay. the idea of the cohesion there. But it's I a sub, subcommittee sense. of the working group. So there's sub Correct. Yes, it sounds there's subcommittees of, it is. I understand that. <laughs> it could be a I don't know what else a sub working group. A sub, I guess <laughs> if you want to call it a sub working group. Sure. Whatever lingo you want to use, but it's like sub group. an offshoot of the working group. That, uh, for me, you know, if I'm the appointed one for ECAC, I, I'm very good to hear that there could be other members in these sub uh, committees or working groups. Um, that would be very um, helpful. And I guess I would state that I would be very interested in working on the solar assessment, but not so interested in working on the solar bylaw. So again, but. I, we can't, so we have we have to also be careful about open meeting law because you are a committee. So you can probably have one other person work on the like one person can be working on the assessment and one person representing ECAC can be on the bylaw. But if you recall what I said earlier, drafts of both pieces are coming back to you for a review and comment. So it's not like you will not have an opportunity to weigh in or have well, input. It's not going to be at the end. It's not going to be at the final. It's the idea is that you're, you know, I would think of it a bit similar to the CARP in that you weighed in a lot along the way, right? Mm -hmm. It What got developed was the result of a lot of input from all of you over time. That was what resi resulted in the final document. I see this as a similar kind of thing in that you will be weighing in along the way, that there will be sort of drafts of what are the steps that are happening, you know, in, in looking at that and being able to weigh in as you go along, as they go along. I feel like something else needs to be written in here, Stephanie, because as you said, you're just trying to rein in this um, stampede to move ahead on the bylaw without an assessment and um, integrate them in some way. And um, we cannot know, and having it written down wouldn't guarantee, but it helps to have it written down that ECAC members will be a part of the sub working groups. Well, okay, I, I think it's in there. I think, you know, it, okay. it already says that you all are the final authorities and you're reporting back to you all. You it's all the are going to have- Not on the bylaw. It's uh, okay, you want it. Okay, I see what you're saying. I mean, I think the idea was that both, both the because the planning board is also going to be looking at the assessment as well of as course. we go along. So, right, I so, hope so it's, right, exactly. What I said at the very beginning is you two committees will be looking at both, but the, but the ultimate final say on the draft, on the final drafts, the planning board has the bylaw, you have the assessment. It but is you're not both looking at both. Being at the table with this diverse group discussing it different than having our own meeting and reviewing. So, well, okay. 
I don't know how many represent. Well, you have a representative. I I can't. You can't have more than one because you have mm -hmm. open meeting law issues. We so can only one of you have more than one. This is going to be a group. public posted meeting. No, this, it's this not necessarily. I mean, it's a working group. So, so we can. Like I don't want to have a big argument about this because well. I really feel like I just. If you if you have some suggested language, I will happily take it. I just don't want to get in a battle over it. I mean, the idea was this is supposed to be transparent. It's supposed to be bringing people in. You're supposed to have a voice. That is the goal. So it's not like anyone's working against you, you know, or around you. The idea is that it's shared. I think you answered a question I had. Was it the, the working group meetings, would they be public meetings subject to public open meeting law? They could They could be. Well, they're, I mean, it's a working group, so it's not necessarily. And I think in part because we were a little worried about the, you know, the, um, the constraints to have to always, I mean, I think we can post them. But the constraints of open meeting law make it really hard, as you all know, to sometimes get work done. And because there's such a pressure to move things forward, um, you know, I think the idea was a working group would get things forward and the public, the public piece, the public review piece would be during planning board meetings and your ECAC meetings, okay. that that's the opportunity. And that's why you all will be reviewing these things as they go along. Mm -hmm because that's the opportunity for public comment and for people weighing in. But we can do more, you know, I mean, it's nothing to say we can't do more than that. One other comment I would make is I, I, I think I would be a little uncomfortable of having a, a rep from the solar industry as a voting member, just mm -hmm. a conflict of interest. So nope. having them perhaps as a non-voting member might be more appropriate. Sure, no, that's great. That's great feedback from you and Laura. Or, or a I professor guess. with expertise with the industry like Laura said. Yeah. Dwayne? I guess I was just for clarification, maybe a, a recommendation on the language is that it says um, the committee will include two subcommittees. Uh, and I presume that means the working group will include two subcommittees. Um, uh, but then I thought you had mentioned, Stephanie, that in the constitution of the subcommittees, um, the working group could decide to bring in some other expertise uh, to work on those subcommittees. Yep. And, and if if and that would allow somebody else from ECAC to join a working group uh, or a person, an, another expert that we that we or somebody else thinks would be really great from the town. Um, and I'm wondering if that might be explicitly um, stated in this memo yep. um, that that's that's at least an option. Yeah, sure. I can add. I can add that because I, I agree that it doesn't explicitly say that in the in um, identifying the makeup of the sub working groups, even though yeah. we call them subcommittees. And I'll tweak the language again. I mean, again, this was just a draft. You yeah. know, um, it, you know, we're still trying to get this figured out because it's yeah. it's it's been a bit muddy for people and some people didn't even know where to begin so i was trying to find a way to lay it out so that it's clearer but i do agree that bringing in expertise for the for the sub working groups was kind of the vision yeah that's what i was expecting is that you know those sub working groups will just have additional people beyond just the working group Great. it gives um, more people an opportunity to weigh in go ahead sorry Andrew. thank thank you so much stephanie for stepping in and initiating this and you know, thinking so well about it. I think this will be a good process um, and that, you know, we will have a lot of say. Um, so I appreciate that. Sure. I do just want to say that the interpretation of open meeting law constraints um, is that n no more than a, um, a, a Quorum, no, no more than than a, a majority of our group can meet without posting, but it's it's not just two; it's however many well, our quorum we, is. We can't been, exceed quorum, right, for decision making, no, no, no. and because right. But you also, when you're having your meetings, you have to have a quorum. But when you're doing work, there's still open meeting law doesn't pertain to just the, the decision making that happens within your meeting. It also happens when you're having conversations and having deliberation that's outside your meetings. 
that's right. that's what this addresses and i've we many people have very differing views i am going by what i have been guided by from the town clerk's office and that is what i have to go by if you can take that up with the town clerk's office if you have a differing interpretation it's yeah. just what i it's, and i it's much i hear you. more restrictive than the council goes by than other committees go by and then that other municipalities go so it's just really is limiting our the speed at which we can work and and be using our expertise where it's needed. I'd say that so I could put it into the notes. <laughs> I also wanted to say thank you, Stephanie. Um, sometimes it seems we, we put you on the hot seat of all these questions and um, you have to defend a lot in front of all of us. And it almost seems like we're arguing and fighting, but you know, I, I really appreciate what you've done here and pulled this together because there has been a lot of confusion it, and no one seems to know. Everybody agrees we need a solar study and a bylaw and everybody's like, I don't know who's going to do it. You know, town council's like, oh, you know. so this is great. I'm glad that you've done this and presented this and are, are, are shepherding it through whatever the process is that needs to get it approved. And I think it's overall, it's great. And I think um, I'm really happy that you've done this and thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, a big step forward. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and yeah, I I think we're just since I I'm personally just sensitive because I feel like the reason why we're doing solar has been left out of most of these discussions up until recently, and so I want to make sure that it's not left out of these these things not I don't think it will be but I am just sensitive to that um so so okay so any anything else on this or should we move on to the next agenda item okay um so so Duane I don't know if you have any updates on your idea that you presented last time yeah okay I didn't and I, I thought we were going to not have it on the agenda but that being said I I did um uh, so I um, am very interested in, in uh, um, this concept of um, whether it makes uh, sense or is viable and, and sensitive uh, to um, potentially look at the opportunity for using reparation funds uh, that, that the town has provided to the black community, um, a, a, a clear national leader in that effort, uh, and whether amongst their options that they might look at, and there is a um, I believe it's the African American Reparations Assembly uh, Committee, which I think is sort of parallel to us as a town committee, um, uh, and whether they might, they I'm sure looking at various different options, but um, we were curious at the Clean Energy Extension to look at an option of where by uh, solar reparations funds could be used and leveraged to provide a, a business opportunity for the black uh, community for uh, owning uh, uh, developing an LLC to own solar and provide um, deep energy uh, electricity discounts to um, black community members in town through net metering. And so we've done that analysis and it looks, looks pretty interesting if, if, uh, to me. Uh, so in discussions with Stephanie and Laura um, decided that um, instead of bringing it up at this point, it's a bit premature, uh, I happen to have a contact from UMass who um, is a colleague with this Energy Transition Institute, uh, but also he happens to also be um, a member of the, the uh, uh, Reparations Assembly for town. Uh, so actually just today, I um, shared with him a, um, an email and, a, and a, a brief analysis on this and an, uh, um, a, a, an ask if he would be interested in um, discussing it further. Uh, and and if so, I'll I'll keep you informed. If that makes sense to everybody. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, any questions for Dwayne? Otherwise, we can move on to um, a dis the discussion on invitation to state official to review mass decarbonization plans, which. 
we talked a little bit la about last time and it sort of morphed into an idea around um, community education and outreach. Um, and I think Vasu, you had been tasked with me with um, thinking about it a little more. And so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so I was thinking about our stakeholders. Oh, oh. weird feedback. So do you want me to? You have a weird feedback, but do you want me to try to share for you? And I don't know if it has. Yeah, but your audio is really messed up. Is my audio okay now? No. I mean, it's cool, but it's hard to understand you. <laughs> the great Darth Vader voice. How about now? Oh, now it's fine. Yeah, much better. Okay, sweet. You can try to share, and if it doesn't. Work, let me okay. know. Okay, so I was thinking about our stakeholders being town councilors, the community, neighboring towns, uh, and also businesses. So with that in mind, I know we were talking about education series and you know we, we talked about you know why can't we turn lights off for a few hours? So I, I came up with a timeline, so uh, something that we could aspire to. And you know, one of the things that I have in bold is the town council review. And this is you know, stemming from the fact that you know, I emailed the district five councilors and they said, why can't we just all get all the town councilors uh, together in one meeting? So I figured you know, maybe a quarterly review with the town councilors might be beneficial. Um, so that's the one in bold that I have. And then uh, highlighting the ones in red here is, thinking maybe there's a potential for Amherst having holding a climate change festival where we can include uh, yeah, the businesses like Amherst Cinema to you know, show movies. Uh, we can bring businesses for education series and also you know, uh, trying to, you know, whether it's selling EV vehicles or you know, other uh, you know, eco-friendly options. Um, but also work with businesses to see if there's um, potential to where we can, you know, turn off lights, yeah, and, you know, for an hour um, and, and do some education around that as well. Um, along with that, I was also thinking that we should have this semi-annual climate newsletter. We're always waiting towards the end where we publish our annual newsletter. And maybe there's an op potential here to do a semi-annual, so we're not rushing towards uh, the end of the year to complete that. And so we can also see as, as a committee uh, on how we're tracking to our goals for the year. Um, one of the things that I included on the timeline is the uh, bringing someone together from the state to talk about climate change, but also discuss our CARP as part of that process. And then everything that you see on the bottom here are education. That's so you might have frozen fair at the middle school. Oh, you're back now. It's just done. Okay. Sorry. So missed, um, the, the education. I'm sorry. We missed a couple sentences there. Okay. So um, the climate change goals. Uh, we talked about this, bringing in some uh, state representative to talk about uh, climate change, but also tag team with. Someone in our committee to talk about the CARP and you know our goals for 2025 and beyond, and then at the bottom here is all the education series that uh, I know Andrew you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, but we were also thinking that maybe there's a potential to combine these activities with some of the other businesses, uh, like I know the climate fair that happens at the middle school or the library read together event. So I put together this timeline that we can possibly track to, again, I'm open to any feedback or comments here. Uh, one of the other things that I missed over here is, is this one, is in order to engage the community, I think for them to see some sort of a scorecard that says, this is where we're at in yeah, emissions and, um, and it's published either on the website or um, in the town building um, as one way to, uh, you know, bring the com uh, the community together along with uh, this over here, uh, which will be a, a pretty large undertaking if we're deciding to have a week long climate change festival.
Any comments there? You guys still can hear me, right? Yeah, thanks. I'm just checking to see. Um, yeah, this is helpful, Vasto. I think it's, um, and maybe we can take it in phases. I have. I think it's helpful to have this like larger picture um, view of, of what we could potentially do. Um, agree that it would be a big undertaking to do a week long festival, but maybe if someone else took the lead on it and we could support in some way, um, that that may may help. Um, you know, I think we could be creative to think about that. Um, but we could also just get started with some of the the first ones we've talked about and then sort of reassess and see maybe at the town council review period, see like where we want to go go from there as well. Yeah, Steve. I think this looks great, I, and I love the timeline format it, format of it, Basu. Um, I wanted to, I guess, report that I have spoken to a couple different people. Just earlier today, I spoke with Anna Goldstein, who's uh, with the Energy Transition Institute at UMass, um, which is pretty new endeavor, and they're having a kickoff event on February 28th, so you should check out their website and maybe check out that. Um, she and I talked and we agreed that yeah, some kind of uh, education program around this, the Massachusetts Climate Action Plan would, would be valuable. Um, we, we don't really have anything more definite than that. Uh, I've also been talking with my colleagues at Hampshire College about doing something a little bit more local to Hampshire College, but it would be similar, some kind of event to allow people to learn more about Massachusetts Climate Action Plan. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on this. I don't have anything definite, um, but I would love to get some representatives from the state. And I, I'm not sure if that's from DOER, and, and Dwayne, you could probably help with this, but to, to do as part of the outreach of the ongoing clean energy and climate plan for 2025 and 2030. And this is, Andra mentioned this earlier, the, the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030, that's a plan and that has actionable goals. What I was referring to earlier, the decarbonization, 2050 decarbonization, that's a roadmap and that's a little bit different. That lays out a series of different possible pathways. And then those possible pathways get condensed or reduced into a plan. So you're right, Andre, it's the CECP, Clean Energy and Climate Action Plan. That's under review, as I understand right now, and should be getting published in March with more opportunity for community meetings. And then it's supposed to be signed into law early July, I think. So I'm hoping that we might be able to get some, some officials from the agencies that are developing that plan as, as part of their responsibility to promote it to the public to come on out here to Western Massachusetts and do it in the Pioneer Valley. And perhaps that could be coordinated with ETI, five colleges. Um, and then I also, a few weeks ago, had conversations with Senator Joe Comerford and she was very interested in that sort of outreach. So I've, I've got some, things, some feelers out there. I don't have a whole lot of definitive things yet, but I guess I'm, I'm continuing to work on that to find some specific people that we can invite that might be able to speak to that clean energy and climate action plan. That's great. Thanks, Steve. So, we, we should probably since you're on and try to see what you do or come back. Oh, Bob, that's your, your, your sound is bad again. Oh, jeez. I don't know what's mm -hmm. going on. Oh, um, you're back. <laughs> I think it sounds like your internet might be like flaking out yeah. a little bit the wrong time. 
did you want to try to respond to Steve's point again? Yeah, you know, I was saying, Steve, since you're you're working on, I, I guess, with so many different people, can we partner to see how we can collaborate and maybe even combine a few of these activities? Yes, I will do that. I will keep you informed as I come up with more specific things. I'll, I'll that we can work together. That sounds perfect. Okay. Thanks, Steve. I, I would just add, in terms of getting a state official out here, um, I think that's you know great and also very much in line with their um, um, responsibilities, quite frankly. Uh, and and but I, I would you know uh, they they may be planning some sort of roadshow, uh, and so we might check in with them to to, to see um, if they are planning a roadshow with something like this. I, I I wouldn't doubt it. They would to have some regional meetings. You know, it may not be. It may only be sort of in Springfield or something um uh because western mass they, is pretty pretty large for them it seems like so uh so i don't i don't know if they would i don't know if they would do so like a singular thing for the town of amherst because they probably you know can't can't uh, uh justify going town by town by town but you know if the town wanted to coordinate help to coordinate something uh that would bring in other other towns and maybe with the regional planning agencies to uh to have a you know have have uh um, Amherst sort of be a be a hub uh, for that, and and, uh, um, and you know maybe some act opportunity to discuss what's going on in Amherst, particularly with the state um, state folks. Um, uh, I, I think we could um, something along those lines uh, would make sense. Yeah, Dwayne, I'm I'm hoping that the the ETI will have kind of the 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 status to help do that. <laughs> So that, that's what Anna and I. I would say about. yes and no. Uh, I mean, I know ETI <laughs> intimately, <laughs> I know um, I and they're getting off the ground, uh, and and their their focus is more, um, I wouldn't scholarly and academic research in in this um, area of of uh, energy transition and equity, uh, um, and and maybe less so on on sort of the community outreach. Uh, that being said. Um, I think they're looking for opportunities to get their name out as well. Uh, and so, uh, and Anna, Anna is the right person to, uh, to be talking to. Uh, Dwayne, do you know other folks that in the, the state government that would be appropriate people to ask about whether they're doing a road show or could they do a road show? Sure. And, and, and Stephanie may know better, but um, uh, um yeah, it would. The, the 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 plan itself is coming out of EEA, the Secretariat. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it would be it would be I think an inquiry to them as opposed to DOER, because okay. uh, it does cover things beyond energy. Um, and um, I'm actually blocking on on um, the person's name. She's been I've been on a few of the webinars that they've had, and she seems to be the one that sort of primarily at the staff level, at least in charge of developing the plan and the outreach and so forth. I can find that name for you, Steve, um, okay. as opposed to, you know, asking the secretary, for example. Dwayne, I have a meeting um, with the Green Communities Advisory Group on Friday. Okay. Oh. Um, so I could just inquire there. I mean, those folks are going to know. That would be excellent. Yeah, I was also thinking of Mark Rabinsky. He you know, as somebody we could speak to, he's the regional coordinator for green community. So I think right. his knowledge base is a bit limited in terms of the whole plan, but he could be somebody that's easily at our disposal and particularly Stephanie's uh, with with these types of uh, questions um, as well. Yeah, Mark will be at the meeting and also Joanne Bassetta will be there. So I think, you know, there'll be people that might know, you know, broader, more information in terms of the contacts yeah. for that than, than Mark even, as you said but I can ask. There, there's also a number of other planning processes that are going to require community um, meetings. Um, for instance, the um, gas planning process that uh, we're trying to have some input into through that letter. Um, is required to do five different community meetings, I think, after this, after they get their plan. 
I, I might be mixing that up with another one, which is the net zero stretch code, which just dropped yesterday. Um, the draft uh, was um, pulled out of the uh, DOER um, and um, they, they have to do community outreach as well. Um, so Ian Finlayson is one of the good guys we've met with before. I know Dwayne very friendly with him. Um, and he, he's usually very in the know. He'd be a good person to talk with and very accessible. Yeah, that's a good idea, Andra. Um, yeah, Jesse, your hands up. Yeah, I, I just, first of all, it's great to and overwhelming to see about a year of activity um, shown, but I think it's really helpful. In my brain at least relates well to this graphic representation. So I really appreciate you putting it together. Um, one very small specific idea just like i've got a lot but the the idea of this um, semi-annual climate newsletter or our annual leading up to the annual report i think one of the things that's been happening is the reports getting more standardized um and i wonder if this upcoming summer might even just be an internal version where we work to template it and make it make it so you know the idea being that this should be an easy task for us it should and and it should be a task that anyone could do and it should be a task that can take that institutional memory and so let's maybe you know creating it as a document like maybe the first step is creating it as a document that is i don't want to go so far as say form fields but it's very user friendly and if all of us got hit by a bus and they appointed a new committee and it was time for them to write their new report here to make it a little more turnkey. So an, an investment in efficiency of our communication it might be the first step for that. We can only get hit by an electric bus though, so. Um... I was just gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> Great dorky minds think alike. Um, <laughs> but we can all get killed by a fossil fuel bus. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we need to keep this conversation on the agenda. Agenda, maybe Vesu, this could be something we we raise during ECAC member updates to make sure we're we're thinking about. I like that idea, Jesse. I like us trying to. I, I like us combine, I mean, we know we all don't have a lot of time and the people in our community don't have a lot of time. So how can we combine this with other information and other things is important. Um, but I, I still think there seems like there's interest in this, a couple avenues to explore around start kicking this off with some state level information. Um, so maybe we can talk about that, see if, if Steve or Dwayne um, and Vasu, you know, if there's any updates on that for next time and, and continue that discussion. Um, and thanks for flagging that energy transition event, Steve. Um, that'd be good too. Yeah, Vasu, do you have something else to add? Yeah, uh, one of the other things in the timeline is the quarterly town council review. Is that still something that we wanna do? You want me to start reaching out to, I'm gonna be talking to the district four councilors as well about bringing the council president um, to meet with all of us. And, is that Stephanie? Is that something that we want to do? So the, um, the quarterly review is um, the town manager presents mm -hmm. a quarterly update to the town council. So we would be basically reporting to the town manager that they're asking him to do that. They're not asking the committee to do that, hmm. if that makes sense. So, I mean, ultimately, you're going to want to reach out to him, I think, um, or via me. You kind of have to go through me to get that information to him. Hmm. I know it's a little circuitous. Yeah, no, I guess my, my point was how do we continue to engage the town councilors, right? I know we're all taking separate action items to meet with each of the district councilors, but can we 
bring them into a conversation and say, here's the update for the quarter. This is what we've done. And this is our expectation going forward for the next I, few months or so. I almost think the direct outreach that you all are starting now is the way to do it, quite honestly, because the town manager can report out. But if you go to a meeting, I think you have very little time, very little engagement, honestly, you're part of a huge agenda. But if you take the time to make a relationship with your individual counselors, you know, that's, that's where you're going to build the rapport and get the information mm -hmm. so that more, the more one on one conversations that you have, um, the more you're able to share more information. So more of them have it versus it's just another report that gets put in their packet of a million other things. And even if you present at their meeting, honestly, I don't think that's going to get you, uh, that's going to get the kind of absorption of the information when it's part of a big meeting that has a lot of other agenda items. And mm. even if you give a report, I think the way to do this is, is what you're doing right now. I think this is a great model going forward. Share the information with your district counselors and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them about it. If we do this right, they're going to be calling us once a week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, they might start reaching out to you. So that's what you want. You want to build that rapport. And I think that's the way to do it. I think, yeah. this is, you know, it's a brilliant approach. And I think that's we could potentially combine. I mean, I think maybe quarterly or, or, you know, we have our annual report, but uh, maybe want quarterly, maybe ambitious, but <laughs> maybe once in the summer, you know, or in a couple months, we, um, you know, if conversations with our counselors have waned or if we like haven't been making as much progress we want, like we draft a quick bulleted email with like what we've been working on and we all share that again with our counselors, like as a way to keep up the communication. So it doesn't have to be a presentation to the meeting because I agree with Stephanie, those can be um, quite formal and not that helpful. Um, but I like that idea of like on a quarterly basis, checking in and seeing, you know, is there anything we want to share with our counselors that we haven't shared recently? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay. I see we're running up on time. So the only last agenda item was CPACE pace next steps. I think this can be rolled into the discussion on outreach because I think, um, what we had talked about, and this was, I think, on my agenda to do, um, is, is, and I talked with Stephanie briefly about it last week, um, to try to get a kind of a list of people that we would want to potentially talk to about CPACE. And so once we have that, um, maybe we'll talk about this on a, on a future agenda item, but doing some targeted outreach to some business owners and building owners to make sure they know about the program and, um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll sh save that for another, another time. Um, I think we've, we've, we've made some good progress. Um, anything else that folks want to put down as a, as an agenda item for, for next time? I kind of wanted to get back to, um, well, maybe, maybe it's the timeline. Maybe we can add more things to the timeline. Um, I, would, I think it would be helpful for us to get a sense of the, um, the cycle of, of grants that are like set in stone. I know that, you know, lots of grants just appear, um, but like the green community process how, how often does that happen if we could just have that in there then we would know okay so you know let let's have a conversation ahead of time so that we're we're thinking together about what we want to submit this time if anything and um rather than it just kind of you know being all uh at at, at the moment that we have to do something or decide something or, or Stephanie just doesn't have time to, you know, even bring it to us because she has to, so much to do and does it all so well and there's too much. Mm -hmm. so. And there might be other things 
you know, like in the community that we would add to the timeline to help us not be blindsided by, you know, things that we could predict <laughs> and, and work into our meeting planning. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. We can talk with Stephanie about how feasible that is. Um, yeah, I, I raised my hand. Sorry, uh, I can I can help with that, but I need to know everything that's going on. And Stephanie, if you want to, uh, you know, send me a list of something, all, all the actions, and I mean the rest of the group. If you want to send me individually with dates, I can I can help with that. I can do my best to get you some. I can't get you everything. I can get you what I know and what I typically go for. Green community is one, is one that we always go for. But again, you know, it depends on if we've gotten a grant, we have to make sure that we um, have completed the projects before we apply. We have to have all our reporting in, all the funds have to be expended. So it's not like just because a cycle comes up doesn't mean we can apply for it. Right. So, and in fact, we, we just recently finished our last grant funding and we had that for two years um, and the lighting project finally got implemented, COVID kind of threw things off, but um, we are probably not gonna apply in the spring, but most likely we'll apply in the fall. And again, that's to be more strategic about what we're applying for because I, you have to have engineering studies. So these things have to be kind of planned out ahead of time. It's not like you could just say, well, we wanna do this. It's like. We got to know ahead of time. So um, we've got some building uh, engineering studies that were happening um, with the fire department and some other buildings that we've, the building um, facilities manager is, is helping me with. Great. Yeah, that, you know, I think, you know, even maybe just having a discussion about that would be, would be helpful. Um, okay, any other ideas folks can feel free to email to me and Andra um, or to Stephanie. Um, okay, I'm gonna see if anybody else has a public comment. Okay, I- Martha. Since hands up, I'm just gonna get my timer here. No worries. Um, so yeah, Martha, um, I've unmuted you, but I think Laura is going to make sure she yeah, has so her I'm, timer going. I'm Martha Hanna from District 5. And just full disclosure, I am a, a planetary scientist. So I do my best over the decades to keep up with uh, climate research and you know concern and so on. And also full disclosure, I'm also a member of our town's social uh, justice uh, our League of Women Voters Racial Justice Committee. And so, uh, Duane, I, I was thrilled by, you know, your inspired idea here uh, for the reparations. I, I think it's very positive, all the kinds of outreach you're doing. One of the things, uh, maybe have you uh, connected with the high school, the, the Sunshine uh, Committee and so on? I think it's important to involve some of, of those people. But I do want to say, um, Stephanie, you, you know, you do such a terrific job trying to, you know, pull everybody together, do all those, but I will have to, uh, you know, play devil's advocate just a little here on reaction to the uh, working group and saying, you know, why is there no representation uh, from the community? You know, we saw this you know, when the work on racial justice, this always comes up, you know, everybody talks a, a good line and then it never happens. But, you know, to say that, oh, well, you know, the members of the community are biased or, or they don't know anything or, or so on is, is really, uh, I, think, I think wrong. I think it's very important that the stakeholders should be involved in the discussion at the beginning. And so that you don't have the phenomenon that it's all the way at the end when the you know, town council is debating the final thing and then everybody tries to speak up. Uh, I really would urge uh, to reach out and have one or two um, members of the public. I've been very impressed 
with uh, the way some members of the community have really dived in. They've learned all the ups and downs of all the state regulations. They've, uh, you know, read the literature. There are some very knowledgeable people out there who I think would be uh, really enthused to be involved and could be quite helpful. So I would really urge you all to, to consider that. And I think you're working on, you know, all kinds of interesting things. And, and the more you can involve the, the community and to recognize this, there's a lot of experts out here. Um, I, I think that would be very helpful. It would not be opening Pandora's box to invite the public uh, in more. I think we need more in reach as well as outreach. So thank you and keep up all your good work. Thanks, Martha. And just to be very clear, Laura Drocker was the one who said all that, not Stephanie. <laughs> but the what? Um, said the Pandora's box comment. And oh, 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 no, no, so. no, I wasn't trying to imply it was Stephanie. No, but, okay. but you know, it, it's what Stephanie said at the beginning about what was it? Uh, sociocracy, you know, it can be it can be vexing and make things take longer, but in the end, it comes out with a with a better result. And and I see this, you know, from my racial justice committee in the in the Cress uh, program. That was a painful year with everybody, uh, ups and downs. But I think now we've actually are coming up with something that's going to work. And and I could see this happening in things like the. Uh, solar and, and all our efforts. And just one final thing, if, please. Um, Steve, I would love to get more information about the solar project at Hampshire. Is there any report or is there a way that, that you guys could, could do a, a presentation on, on your process there? Because uh, as I understand, it's about 25 acres. And it seems to me that would be, a, I'd love to see you know a dozen of those around town. Uh, of that kind of size and uh, would love to learn more. So thank you. Thanks, Martha. Steve, do you want to say anything or? That's a great idea. And I, I'm talking to some colleagues at Hampshire about that, making sort of showcasing the Hampshire process and the result. So yes, thank you, stay tuned. Great, okay, we're, we're up on time. Any last public comment before we go? All right, I don't see anybody. So thank you everyone for another great meeting and uh, we'll keep it going. Thanks. Bye, thanks.